Today we're going to study about those two witnesses in the book of Revelation. So take your Bibles, turn to Revelation chapter 11. This is actually the conclusion. I wanted to try to include it last week, but the previous week before I didn't get far enough in my notes. So last week I couldn't get this part of the message in, so we can spend the whole time today because what we were talking about is the ministry of Elijah and actually doing a series about Elijah and Elisha. Next week we'll start talking about Elisha, but we wanted to conclude with the, the last thing we know about the ministry of Elijah, which is in the future. And he's found here in Revelation chapter 11, where God introduces two witnesses, and we're going to identify the two witnesses and, uh, and then show the different Bible verses that talk about that. So we'll be spending the time, this will be the conclusion of the life of Elijah. We don't even have to go back to 1 Kings or 2 Kings to talk about him. I'll remind you of some things we, we cl- concluded with last week so that uh, you can have that in your recollection as we talk about the events that are going to be here in the book of Revelation. Uh, Revelation chapter 11, let me just start with the first four verses. It says, And there was given unto me a reed like unto a rod, and the angel stood, saying, Rise and measure the temple of God, and the altar, and them that worship therein. But the court, which is without the temple, leave out, and measure it not. For it is given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city shall they trodden underfoot forty and two months. And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days clothed in sackcloth. Let's pray. (coughs) Our God and Father, I pray that uh, the information will not only be informative and kind of actually uh, raise uh, some interest and curiosity of future days, Uh, But we pray that it will also be edifying even to understand uh, your work and what you're doing. And most of all, that it might glorify your son as we see what's taking place in this chapter and these two witnesses in the last days. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. The two witnesses are being introduced in Revelation chapter 11. And maybe I'll wait and give you a little bit of... Uh, back up uh, information about what chapter 11 it, it, as it sits in the book of Revelation. Uh, but one of the things is we want to point out is out of the two witnesses that are going to show up here, we've said, I think even from the first day that we talked about Elijah, he's one of these two witnesses. Uh, you get an idea who I think the second witness is from our study last week when we were talking about uh, Elijah and his ministry. You might recall some of the events that we talked about where Elijah, the last two, the, the, the sixth and seventh miracle that Elijah did was that he called fire down from heaven and consumed the, uh, the armies of the, the captain and the 50 men that came with him to bring him to King Ahab. And, and uh, he kept saying, if I'm a man of God, let fire come down from heaven. <laughs> and finally the third captain begged for mercy and he finally went to King Ahab and, and told him, that, oh, not one King Ahab, it was his son, uh, Ahaziah, and let him know that he was going to die because he was seeking uh, the prophets of Baal rather than the prophet of God. Uh, but anyhow, he called down fire from heaven. And when we were talking about that, we started, I did a comparison. It was in last week's bulletin because it, it fit last week's message and it would have fit this week's message too, but I'll just remind you of the uh, things that we saw, the similarities uh, between Moses and Elijah. And as we'll go down through chapter 11, you'll, you'll see that I believe the two witnesses are not witnesses like Moses and Elijah, but will be Moses and Elijah themselves that are going to come back in a future day in the tribulation when, uh, when God raises up two prophets in the dark hours to witness to the nation of Israel, not to the nation of Israel, but to the whole world. Anyhow, in that list, I listed eight things that are similar between Moses and Elijah. Uh, The ministry of Moses began where God called him from Mount Horeb. And, and, uh, well, that's a second. Anyhow, and then also that's a place where Elijah ran to, to hear uh, the witness of God. In Moses' day, they bowed down to the golden calf. In Elijah's day, Israel's bowing, bowing down to the two calves, one in, in Dan and the other in Bethel. Uh, but anyhow, when Moses was on the mount, he went 40 days and 40 nights without eating. 
when Elijah went to Mount Horeb in the travel there, he traveled and it said he didn't eat or drink, well, it just says he didn't eat, for 40 days and 40 nights. Uh, and God sustained him just without eating during that whole time. Um, Moses thought he was the only one that didn't bow to that golden calf, and he just about was, or just a couple others that didn't. But Elijah thought that he was the only one that hadn't bowed down to the knee to Baal and found out that God had preserved 7,000 that didn't bow the knee to Baal. But both Moses and Elijah were depressed over Israel's apostasy before their idolatry. And, uh, and God encouraged Moses by letting him see his glory as, as God passed by him, put him in the rock and passed by him. And Moses saw the backside of the Lord and saw the glory of God. Elijah in Mount Horeb, he's in a cave and God passed by him in that cave. And he wasn't in the earthquake and wasn't in the wind and wasn't in the fire, but was in a still small voice. Well, Moses at the same time, he, he at, at Mount Sinai, they saw the fire, the earthquake and heard the voice of God. And then when God spoke to them out of that fire and gave them a warning, gave them the covenant of law and a warning about breaking the law, certainly there God gave, in Mount Horeb, God gave Elijah uh, the judgment that's going to fall on the nation of Israel because of their breaking the law that he made with Moses and Israel back in Mount Sinai. And, and so there, there's all those similarities. But the last one is the, is the one that really kind of brings you in today's study. The last similarity was that, and, and I'm not going to take you back to Deuteronomy 32, but back in thir chapter 31 and 32, in 32 it actually happens, God tells Moses in 31 that he's going to die in the wilderness. They, they came to the, the river Jordan. Now not, that's not the river that Emmanuel sang us about, which she's reading about that throne, the river that runs by the throne of God is Revelation 22. But there is a, a river Jordan where Elijah, where Moses was on the, I gotta get my east and west right, was on the uh, east bank of the Jordan River. He could go up to Mount uh, Moab, I think. Uh, that's not the mount, it was in Moab. Anyhow, he went to the mount and he could see the promised land. But because he disobeyed God at Kadesh, that God told him that he's not going to enter into the land. And in chapter 32, he's told to go up to the mount, see the land, and then he died in that mount. And uh, so he never entered the land. The last thing we saw about Elijah is that he was in the land, he parted the Jordan River, went to the east side of the Jordan River, and then a whirlwind came, and uh, the chariots of fire, and a whirlwind took him up and carried him away into heaven. And he died on the other side of Jordan as well, outside the promised land. And that's interesting because both of them are going to come back and witness in a future day. And that brings us to our study here. But before I go any further in chapter 11, the book before Revelation is the book of Jude. And Jude says something about the people in the last days and their rebellious times. And, uh, but I just wanted you to see how he relates to the rebellion of the last days. Uh, Jude, it's only one chapter, so verse 8 and 9 says this. It says, likewise also these filthy dreamers defile the flesh, despise dominion, speak evil of dignitaries. Yet Michael the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses. Durst not bring uh, uh, against him a railing accusation, uh, 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 a railing accusation, but said, the Lord rebuke thee. And then he said, but these, and then he goes on to talk about them. His point is, is that even in the angelic realm, Michael's an archangel, a top angel. And yet when he disputed with the devil, he, he didn't give him a railing accusation. He respected the authority that he had, but he said, the Lord rebuked me. He took the authority above Satan and rebuked him with that authority. So he, it's, a, it's a statement about authority. But what's interesting is you wouldn't even know that there was an incident where Michael and Satan had a dispute. And not only that, what are they disputing about? The body of Moses. Interesting that God tells Moses to go up into that mount. He died in that mountain and no one ever found his body. Elijah disappeared from the earth. God took him alive. He didn't die, but God took him away. But God had a purpose for Moses' body. God preserved the body of Moses. 
just as he preserved Elijah alive in the heaven somewhere. I don't know where he put him in a bubble or how he did that, but it doesn't matter, God did it. And, uh, and so I want you to see that Moses is preserved here. So that, that leads us to these two prophets that show up in the tribulation. And, and that, I, that as we go through this, we'll, we'll see that it's most likely Moses and Elijah. The, one, the reason we, we know that, and I'm going to try to take the Bible in order. So first, let's go back to the second to the last book of the Old Testament, Zechariah. Go back to Zechariah chapter 4. Some of these Old Testament books are a lot like the book of Revelation where they're about visions, not all of them, but certainly these, these uh, prophetical books at the end of the Old Testament. Zechariah has a vision here, and I want you to kind of catch on to some of the things that's being revealed to him. Zechariah chapter 4 and verse 1 says, And the angel that talked with me came again and waked me and as a man that is wakened out of his sleep. So it's like he was asleep, so he's either dreaming something, and the angel wakes him up. And it says in verse 2, And said unto me, What seest thou? And I said, I looked, and behold, a candlestick, all of gold, and a bowl upon the top of it, and seven lamps thereon, and seven pipes to the seven lamps which are upon the top thereof. So the, he, he's having a vision, he's seeing some things, the angel asked him what he saw. Interestingly, when you see a candlestick there, back in Israel's temple, uh, that they had a six candlestick that, light, that would, would light, if you go into the whole, not the Holy of Holies, but if you go into the holy place, which is a tent inside the temple itself, and then behind that is the Holy of Holies, where only the high priest could go once a year when he brought the blood of the atonement there and put it on the altar. But in the holy place, there's a table of showbread, there's a candlestick, and then there's the altar of incense that's just before you go into the Holy of Holies. And that candlestick was the only way you're going to have any light inside of that. The table of showbread had 12 loaves of bread on that table. The, the light from that candlestick put light on a 12 loaves of bread. Those 12 loaves of bread represent the nation of Israel who's supposed to be a light to the world. And they've always failed to be the light of the world. God is going to make sure that they are someday going to be the light of the world. That's what he called Israel to be. So, but anyhow, that, that's a different candlestick. Here he's seeing one, a seven, a seven lamp candlestick. So he's seen one candlestick and it has a branch going out where there's one in the middle, three on each side, seven candlesticks. And above that is a bowl. Now the bowl, the reason for the bowl, verse 4 says, and, I, and, and so I answered and spake unto the angel that talked with me, saying, What are these, my Lord? Uh, no, did I read verse 3? I didn't read verse 3. Verse 3 says, and, the two can, uh, the two, and two olive trees by it, one upon the right side of the bowl, and the other on the left side of the bowl. Now remember, the, bowl, the candlesticks have pipes coming out of them. And here's olive trees. Now, an olive tree produces olives, which when crushed become olive oil. And olive oil is what, how you light a candle, how you light, uh, how, uh, what keeps a candle burning or the candlestick burning. And the pipes are connected to these two trees and they're feeding this bowl. And this bowl is piped to the seven candlesticks so that the, the light has a continual flow right from the tree. These trees are alive, they're producing oil into the bowl, the bowl are feeding the light, and, and, and the candlesticks are, are kept lit because they're connected to these trees. And there's one on the right side and one on the left side. So verse 4 says, So I answered and spake unto the angel that talked with me, saying, What are these, my Lord? And the angel that talked with me answered and said unto me, Knowest thou not what these be? And I said, No, my Lord. And then he answered and spake unto me, saying, This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. Who art thou, O great mountain, before Zerubbabel? Thou shalt become a plain, thou shalt bring forth the headstone thereof, with shouting, crying, Grace, grace unto it. 
Jesus Christ is that headstone. He's going to come back and reign, but he's going to come back and reign because there's going to be this lighting. His spirit is going to be in the nation of Israel. When it talks about their grace, grace be unto it, that's unto the nation of Israel. God is going to give them his spirit. And that's what this is about. This is where you begin to understand that when you see the connection in your Bible to olive oil being a type of the Holy Spirit. And God, this is the new covenant that God's going to give to the nation of Israel where he's going to put his spirit within them, the spirit of life. And they are, by the new covenant, going to be a light to the world someday. And, and so he's seeing the vision of that in, in this vision. But there's more details that are given to this angel. Verse 11 says this, then I answered, then answered I and said unto him, What are these two olive trees upon the right side of the candlestick and upon the left side thereof? And I answered again and said unto him, What are these two olive branches which through the two golden pipes empty the golden oil out of themselves? And he answered and said unto me, Knowest thou not what these be? And I said, No, my Lord. Then said he, These are the two anointed ones that stand by the Lord of all the earth. One on the left, one on the right, the two anointed ones. In Israel, you have anointed prophet, priest, and king. The two anointed ones. Anointed, they have the Holy Spirit. They're ministering to the nation of Israel. And they stand by, now catch that phrase, they stand by the Lord of all the earth. That's the goal of Bible prophecy. Jesus Christ is going to come back and show who's Lord of Lords and King of Kings. He's going to come back and take reign over this earth. He doesn't have reign over this earth right now. But he's going to come back and reign and there's going to be those two olive, those two candlesticks that stand there. Uh, the, these are the two olive, tree, olive, olive branches uh, through which the golden pipes empty their, their golden oil. These are the two the anointed ones that stand by the Lord of all the earth. So, Zechariah is being given this revelation. Well, come over just to, now to Malachi. And Malachi, well, let's read all of chapter 4. Malachi chapter 4, it says, For behold, the day cometh that shall burn... Uh, shall burn as an oven, and all the proud, yea, all that do wickedly shall be stubble, and the day cometh shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts, that it shall leave neither root nor branch. So there's coming a day where God's going to cleanse this earth, and He's going to cleanse it by fire. He's coming back in judgment. And all that do wickedly, they're going to become stubble. They're going to be burned. It says, but unto them that fear the name, uh, uh, my name, shall the sun, and notice that's S-U-N, of righteousness arise with healing in his wings. And he shall go forth and grow up as the calves of the stall. And, and ye shall tread down the wicked, for they shall be as ashes under the soles of your feet. He's burned them up. <laughs> and then, then the, the ones who, who uh, feared the Lord, Honor, feared the name of the Lord, they're going to, the people are going to be like ashes under the soles of their feet in the day that I do this, saith the Lord. So the Lord's going to judge, and then there's the, those that feared him, they're going to be saved. When it says the son of righteousness, the tribulation that's coming is called a day of wrath of thick darkness. It's a day of darkness. At the end of that day of darkness, Jesus Christ is going to come back as the son and literally as the light, a son of righteousness. And he's going to come back with healing in his wings. That's where healing is finally going to take place once and for all. And, and then the believing remnant, or the, uh, the people who are judged, are going to be like ashes under the sole of their feet as they're coming back to the kingdom. So he concludes this by saying this in verse 4. Remember ye the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded him in Horeb, for all Israel with statutes and judgments. So he says, hey, remember Moses. And then he says, behold, I will send you Elijah, that prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. 
And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children, and the heart of the children to the fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. And Jesus Christ is coming back to smite the earth, to smite those that don't believe. But those who are turned to their, the hearts of the fathers, to the children, the children to the fathers, that they remember the law of Moses. They remember the things that God promised the nation of Israel. Those who have repented, they're going to go into that kingdom. The rest of the world are going to be judged and, and burned like ashes, uh, uh, burned and, and become like ashes under the feet of those that finally go into that kingdom. But Elijah is going to come before that great and dreadful day of the Lord come. That is, as Jesus Christ is coming back, that final judgment that's going to come onto this world, that's going to end where he puts down all the wickedness in the world, the Antichrist and all that followed the Antichrist, that, that he comes back in that judgment, and then those that have responded to the ministry of Elijah will enter into that, that kingdom with the Lord Jesus Christ. So, interestingly, that the Old Testament ends with, Remember Moses, behold, I send to you Elijah. You see Moses and Elijah, and we talked about that, that the, the candlestick and the, and the two olive trees are the, the, the two, uh, the, the candlestick is one, but the two olive trees are the two that stand by the Lord of all the earth. And you just start wondering, is that Moses and Elijah? Well, notice the references here. First of all, that Elijah is going to come before that great and dreadful day of the Lord come. That he, there's going to be a time in which Elijah is going to come back and and, and be here before that final burst of judgment comes from the Lord. Uh, and if you come to, with me, we've looked at this once before, but we'll, now we'll look at it again. Matthew chapter 16. I'm going to start in verse 26, because it asks an important question, and the Lord's preparing, they're, remember they're preaching the gospel of the kingdom, the good news that the kingdom was at hand, and the Lord's warning them of things, and about, for, you know, not trying to hang on to this life, but uh, I'll just get right to verse 26. It says, for what is a man's, what, uh, what, what is a man profited, if he shall gain the whole world, and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? You know that there's going to be an Antichrist that's going to come along. You can't buy or sell unless you have his mark. So he asked the question, what does a man profit if he gained the whole world? You got everything that this world has to offer, but lose your own soul. He warns also in another place. He said, fear not him that's able to destroy the body, but is not able to destroy the soul but fear him that's able to destroy both body and soul in hell. That's the judgment of Jesus Christ upon his return. Fear him. Don't fear an antichrist. Because what if you would gain the whole world and lose your own soul? And then the last question, what would a man give in exchange for his soul? The rich man who goes to hell, what he wouldn't have given not to be in hell. He would have gave up all the earth's riches. Well, they're going to be tried in the last days by that antichrist. He says in verse 27, For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then shall he reward every man according to his works. Verily I say unto you, now he's talking about Jesus Christ coming back in glory. And then he says, Verily I say unto you, there shall be some standing here that shall not taste death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Well, that sounds like that kingdom's awful close. If the men standing there, some of them are going to actually see the Lord coming in his kingdom. Well, the way that came true is the next verse. And after six days, Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John. If it's after six days, it must be in the seventh day, right? Just interesting that the tribulation is going to be seven days. Or seven days. Seven years long. And after those seven years, Jesus Christ is going to return as the Son of Righteousness, is he not? And it says, After six days, Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bringeth them into a high mountain apart. Mountain is always a type of a kingdom. And was transfigured before them, and his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment as white as light. So there he is, the glory that was concealed by his fleshly birth. 
is being, he's being transformed. His glory is being seen. He's seen on a mountain, seen as the Lord of all the earth, as you'll see. It says, And behold, there appeared unto, him, unto them Moses and Elijah, talking with him. And, and so here he is, the Lord of all the earth, and who shows up with him? Moses and Elijah. The two great prophets of the Old Testament. Moses represents the law. Elijah represents the prophets. The, that's the message. The, the Old Testament several times is called the law and the prophets. God spoke God's word to the nation of Israel. And as Jesus Christ shows up uh, as a picture of him coming in his kingdom, there's Moses and Elijah. You kind of wonder, is one on the right hand and the other on the left hand? Um, but anyhow, they show up. Peter gets a little bit uh, excited and says something kind of dumb. He wanted to build the tabernacle for them to stay there. And the Lord God the Father says, This is my beloved Son, hear him. Uh, but as they come down from the mount, verse 9 says, And as they came from the mount, Jesus charged them, saying, Tell the vision to no man until the Son of Man be risen from the dead. Jesus Christ first had to die and rise again before he's going to come back in his kingdom. And his disciples asked him, saying, Why then say the scribes that Elias must first come? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Elias, now that, by the way, that's Elijah of the Old Testament, truly shall first come. Before Jesus Christ comes back in his kingdom, he's first going to, Elijah's going to come, and he's surely going to come, and restore all things. So we know that he's going to come before that great and dreadful day of the Lord. He's going to call the people back to a heart toward God, the things that God said to them. And, and he is going to have a ministry of restoring, calling, the believing, calling out a believing remnant. But I say unto you that Elias is already is come already, and they knew him not, but have done unto him whatsoever they listed. Likewise shall they also, also the Son of Man suffer of them. And the disciples understood that he spake unto them of John the Baptist. And we've already studied that John the Baptist is not Elijah. But before the first coming of Christ, John the Baptist did the ministry of Elijah, but they rejected the ministry of, of John the Baptist. And Elijah must come yet before the second coming of Christ when he comes back in his glory. So Elijah will come back, and he is certainly one of those figures that show up in the book of Revelation. Um, the, the other thing that I want you to see in that is the Lord speaking about Elijah coming back and restoring all things. Well, get a little idea of what's going to take place. Now, hold, put something in the book of Matthew. There's one more thing I want to show you in Matthew. But come over to Acts chapter 2, where we ended last week. Now, you realize we're just putting a whole bunch of information together. And that's really what the whole message is about today, although... If you take the warning about what would a man give in exchange for his soul, you realize it's a dangerous thing for someone to reject the gospel. And, uh, and, and so that, that just is a warning that runs all the way through all these verses. But in Acts chapter 2, the reason I stop here again, the Holy Spirit is poured out. And when it's poured out, remember... The ministry, the, 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 the vision that Zerubbabel saw, that uh, Zechariah saw, was a vision that spoke about grace to the nation of Israel, about his spirit, God's spirit, to the nation of Israel. And here God is pouring out, according to the new covenant, the spirit of grace and supplication to the nation of Israel. This is their grace. It's not our dispensation of grace. The, 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 the vision that is a revelation, and God's going to prepare them first, so that when the Holy Spirit is poured out, and Peter stands up to explain what's happening, he says in verse 16, But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. It shall come to pass in the last days. The last days began on the day of Pentecost. Saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. They're going to be that light to the world. Your, your young men shall see visions, your old men shall dream dreams, and on my servants and on my handmaidens I will pour out uh, uh, in, in, the, in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. So that speaking in tongues here was them prophesying a light to the whole world. Israel being that light, God giving them the Holy Spirit, and they're prophesying, they're speaking truth. 
Now there's two things happening there. If he's pouring out his spirit upon the believing remnant of Israel, and, and they're now being able to prophesy, preach to the rest of the world, uh, they're warning the rest of the world about what's to come. And what's to come, it's the last days, verse 19 says, And I will show wonders in heaven above, signs in earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke, the sun shall be turned to darkness, the moon into blood, before that great and notable day of the Lord come. It's called the great and dreadful day that Elijah is going to come before that day. But what he's talking about here is the Holy Spirit's being poured out on the nation of Israel so that they could be a light to that world. But just as that Holy Spirit is being poured out, it's going to be the means by which Israel is going to have the power to endure through that tribulation and go into that kingdom. But in that, but in that same time, the Holy Spirit's going to be poured out first to empower them. And then the next thing, the sun will be darkened, the moon will be turned to blood before that great and notable day of the Lord come, before Jesus Christ actually returns to the earth and sets up, that, sets up that kingdom. And we pointed out last week how they never saw the age of grace. Now, that was last week's message, but the reason I pointed out here is so that you can see God preparing Israel to be a light to the world by giving them the Spirit, according to that prophecy of Zechariah. But look now at the next chapter, chapter 3. Peter, the next day, preaches again to the nation of Israel. He says in verse 19, Repent ye therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. So, he's calling the nation of Israel to repentance, to have an opportunity to have their sins forgiven, when Jesus Christ comes back, which is called a time of uh, of refreshing from his presence. Jesus Christ is going to come back. Verse 20. And he shall send Jesus Christ, which was before preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things. A time of restoration of all things. Which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. For Moses, interesting, for Moses truly said unto the fathers, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren like unto me. But that prophet is the Lord Jesus Christ. Him shall ye hear in all things whatsoever he shall say unto you, and it shall come to pass that every soul which will not hear that prophet shall be destroyed from among the people. Jesus Christ is going to come back in judgment, and those that haven't heard Him and haven't feared Him, He's going to judge them at His return. But His return is going to bring the whole land, it's going to be a time of refreshing, a time of restoration of all things. The land is going to be restored to the Garden of Eden, just like the Garden of Eden, at the second coming of Jesus Christ. And Elijah is going to come first to restore all things, to prepare them to be able to be part of that restoration. Jesus Christ is the one who's going to restore all things, Elijah is going to prepare them for that time to be a part of that refreshing, to call them to repentance. So, I wanted you to see that because we just read where the Lord said Elijah will truly come and restore all things. One more thing I want to show you in Matthew, and if you go to chapter 20, and I say one more thing, that's before we get back to the book of Revelation. <laughs> Revelation chapter 20, or no, Matthew chapter 20. <laughs> Matthew chapter 20, and look at verse 20. And I'll just tell you who this is. You can do your Bible study and find out. But in Matthew 20, verse 20, it says, Then came to him, that is, came to the Lord, the mother of Zebedee's children, and uh, with her sons, worshiping him and desiring a certain thing of him. Zeb the sons of Zebedee is James and John, the two apostles. They just saw the Lord transfigured. They saw Moses and Elijah show up with the Lord on the Mount of Transfiguration. But the mother comes to the Lord and speaks for her sons, and it says in verse 21, And he said unto her, What wilt thou? And she said unto him, Grant that these my two sons may, may sit, one on the right hand and the other on the left, in thy kingdom. Interesting, isn't that? <laughs> Now, you know, these men, the mother might be speaking for them, but they're called sons of thunder. They, they, they're the big three, is Peter, James, and John. 
And, and James, uh, Peter might be the leader, but James and John, they, they're sons of thunder. They, 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 they have really uh, preaching and, and leading leaders among the twelve. But verse 22, But Jesus answered and said, Ye know not what ye ask. Are ye able to drink of the cup that, that I shall drink of, and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? And he's not referring to water baptism here. The cup, he's got a drink of the cup of the wine of the wrath of God. Talk about going to the cross and dying for the sins of the world. Are you able to drink of my cup? It's a cup of martyrdom. And, and be baptized with the baptism I'm baptized with. To be placed into death for the benefit of somebody else. And verse 23, uh, oh, the, the end of the verse, they said unto him, we are able. And he said unto them, ye shall indeed drink of my cup. They're going to be martyred. They're going to die. And be baptized with the baptism I'm baptized with. They're going to be placed into death for preaching the gospel. Not for, not for uh, remission of other people's sins, but for preaching about the remission of sins. But he goes on to say, uh, But to sit on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give, but it shall be given to them for whom it is prepared uh, of my Father. You can't sit on my right hand or my left. It's not for me to give. My father has appointed that. You think the father has appointed that to Moses and Elijah, the two that stand by the Lord of all the earth? That's the only reason I read that is he doesn't grant them that. The father has appointed that. And there seems to be two that show up with the Lord when he comes back to reign on this earth. It's Moses and Elijah. And in fact, they come back before the Lord comes back. To, on that great and dreadful day, before the Lord appears as the Son of Righteousness with healing in His wings. And so we go back to Revelation chapter 11. Now at this point, I'll tell you, remind you of some things we've studied. We, the whole time of talking about Elijah, we've come to the book of Revelation several times. It's when you get to Revelation chapter 10, it seems like there's a break in action as, as God was bringing upon the, the seal judgments, then come the trumpet judgments, and then the final ones are the bold judgments. And I would imagine that great dreadful day is probably the seventh bold judgment itself. But, but either way, uh, there's going to be the, a judgment that's going to come. But when you get to Revelation chapter 10, 11, and 12, even up to 14, you're, you're now in the middle of the tribulation and you're getting details of what God has provided during the time or the events that are going to take place, uh, that's going to take place in the middle of the tribulation and preparing them for the end, the last great uh, events of the great tribulation that's going to take place. When I say that to you, if you just kind of think ahead, I'm not going to repeat all everything, but back in chapter 11, uh, chapter 12 is where Satan was cast out of heaven. And where he then, in verses 13 and following of chapter 12, he goes after Israel and they flee in the mountains and God feeds them there for a time, time, and a half a time. Time, times, and a half a time. One year, times, two, not times, but two years is plural. And then a half a time, three and a half years, God's going to feed them there. We studied that already in the life of Elijah. Um, so anyhow, there, there's three and a half years, so you realize that's the middle of the tribulation until the end. Satan is going to be loosed. He's going after the nation of Israel. Well, the way he goes after the nation of Israel, Revelation 13, is all about the mark of the beast. And you have to receive his mark. And, and, uh, uh, and if you don't receive his mark, and you won't be able to buy or sell. And then as you get to chapter 14, we're going to read some verses from there. Anyone who doesn't receive his mark is going to be beheaded. Those things are all taking place in the middle of tribulation. That mark of the beast, the image of the beast that's going to show up is what Matthew chapter 24 talked about uh, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet. That's right in the middle of the tribulation after Satan is cast out of heaven, he enters the Antichrist, they ultimately set up an image of the beast and order the world to worship that beast. And now it's a real trial of faith that's going to take place. Those are the events that are, some of the events that are in the middle of the tribulation. If you look now at chapter 11 again, you have that reference in verse 2. It says, it, the, the John is told to measure the temple, uh, but to leave out the court. And the reason it says, but the court which is without the temple, leave out, measure it not. For it is given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city shall be trodden under fo on, underfoot, uh, 
It's given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city shall they trodden underfoot forty and two months. How long is forty-two months? Three and a half years. This is that abomination. Israel has to flee into the wilderness because the Gentile nations are going to overrun Jerusalem. And they're going to take control of Jerusalem for the last three and a half years. So there's a warning there. That tells me the timing of what's going to take place. Verse 3. And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand, two hundred, threescore days, clothed in sackcloth. Sackcloth is when someone is burdened about what's taking place here. A mark of the beast, Israel worshiping idols. They, they're, they're, they're in sackcloth and ashes. They're, they're mourning for the nation of Israel. They're warning the nation of Israel, but not just the nation of Israel, as you'll see in this passage. They're warning the whole world about this Antichrist and who the true Christ is, and it's a warning about what's about to take place here. Those two witnesses come, and they're going to minister a thousand, two hundred, threescore days. Divide that by 30, comes out three and a half years. So it looks to me that the two prophets come in the last three and a half years at the very darkest time of Israel's time, just like Elijah came the first time. He's coming at a dark time when the Antichrist sets up that mark and people have to make a decision of what they're going to do. He's there to warn them, to call them to repentance. It says in, uh, in verse 4, These are the two olive trees, and the two candlesticks standing before God of all of the earth. I want to put the word all. Notice the Lord of all the earth is the God of the earth. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. This, that's why we started out with Zechariah. These two men are those two olive trees, those two candlesticks. This is, by looking at, the, at Matthew 17, this is Moses and Elijah. They've come. It says in verse 5, if any man shall hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth, and devoureth their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must, in this manner, be killed. People aren't going to like listening to these preachers warn about the judgment that's coming, and you better fear God and not fear the Antichrist. And so people will try to kill them, but they can't kill them. Uh, it, they actually have the power to let fire come out of their mouth and devour their enemies. And that any of their enemies that come against them must be killed in that manner. Well, who called fire down from heaven? That's the sixth and seventh miracle that we saw that Elijah did just before God took him into heaven. Verse 6. These have power to shut up heaven that it rain not in the days of their prophecy. How long are they going to prophesy? Three and a half years. How long did it not rain in the days of Elijah? Three and a half years. Here he's coming back with the same power and authority that he had before, and it's not going to, he had power to, so it doesn't rain the, the, in the days of their prophecy. And it says, and have power over water to turn to them to blood and to smite the earth with, with all plagues as often as they will. Well, who turned water into blood? Well, if you remember when God, when God first called Moses, and he's having that conversation with them, Mount Horeb there, that Moses said, you know, if I go, they won't, they'll say, Who's, who sent me? He said, well, here, tell them I am sent you. And he said, well, they won't believe me. And he said, what's in your hand? He said, cast it down. And the cane became a serpent. He said, pick it back up. It became a cane again. Then he said, take your hand, put it in your, your, your jacket, whatever, <laughs> and then pull it back out. It was leprosy. Put it back in, came back, leprosy's gone. He says they still won't believe. He said if they don't believe those first two signs, give them this sign, take water, pour it out, and it becomes blood. Moses, the sign that Moses was the man of God speaking to the nation of Israel in the sight of Israel and of Pharaoh, is that he could turn water into blood. And who sent ten plagues? <laughs> who warned Pharaoh about the plagues of Egypt? And it was Moses. And just like there's two signs of Elijah, there's two signs here of, of what Moses did in the past. These two prophets that come are Moses and Elijah. But the question comes up, why do you say, I can't believe it's that time already. <laughs> it's a miracle. Yeah, it's a miracle, all right. <laughs> oh, my. <laughs> oh, some important things. Why Moses and Elijah? We'll get right to the point. 
in, in John chapter 11, when Martha, after Lazarus died, came to the Lord, says, I know he'll rise again in the resurrection of the last days. Jesus Christ said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth in me shall never die, believest thou this. I am the resurrection and the life. Resurrection for those that are dead, life for those who already are alive but don't have eternal life. He that believeth on me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. I'm the resurrection and life. He that liveth and believeth on me shall never die. I'm the life. He's going to give life at his second coming. Jesus Christ is going to come back, and you'll just have to read Revelation chapter 20. In fact, someone wrote me and asked me the question about this. Does all believing remnant die in the tribulation? No. Revelation chapter 14, there's going to be many that are going to be beheaded for not taking the mark of the beast. But Matthew chapter 24, they that endure to the end, the same shall be saved. Some will, never, will endure all the way to the end and receive eternal life at the kingdom when Jesus Christ comes back. They have physical life, they need eternal life. Moses represents the resurrection. Elijah represents the life. And, and Jesus Christ, who Jesus Christ is and what he's capable of doing upon his return. I am the resurrection and the life. Let me finish this chapter at least so that you can see the conclusion because it's a miraculous thing that takes place here. Verse 7 says, And when they shall have finished their testimony, so three and a half years went by, the beast that ascended out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. You know, when Moses, God preserved his body, when he comes back, he's going to have a natural body like Lazarus when he was raised from the dead had a natural body. He's going to die again a second time. Elijah never died the first time. But you don't always have to die because there's going to be some that are going to endure the kingdom. If the rapture takes place this afternoon and you don't die this afternoon, will you be alive when the rapture comes and you'll never face death? Yes, you will. So that is if you have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. But anyhow, the, the point is, uh, is uh, they're going to die after three and a half years of ministry. And their dead bodies shall lay in the street that is called, uh, that it, in the street of the great city, which is spiritually called Sodom and Egypt. Remember, it's overrun with Gentiles. Jerusalem is. Where also the Lord was crucified. <laughs> so is, that's why it's called Sodom and Egypt. It's overrun by the Gentiles. And they of the people and kindred and tongues and nations. So that's the whole world, right? shall see their dead bodies three days and a half, and shall not suffer their bodies to be put in the grave. They finally got victory. They couldn't kill these guys. And finally, at the end, they're able to kill them. And so the whole world is celebrating their death. Because their death kind of represented the fact that we've defeated them, and everything they warned us about is not true. It's not going to happen. And they, and they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice. Now, they're... They're, they're following the Antichrist. They, Antichrist brought victory to them. Rejoice over them and made merry and sent gifts one to another. It's Christmas time. Because the two prophets uh, tormented them that dwelt on the earth. And after three days and a half, a day for every year they ministered, after three days and a half, the spirit of life from God entered into them and they stood up upon their feet and great fear that came, uh, fell upon them that saw them. You know, if these two prophets were causing havoc all over the world, and they're now dead, and the people are rejoicing, it's like they have a live shot camera on these two dead bodies, rejoicing over their death for three and a half years, and while they're watching live camera, and we can do that today, right? While they're watching live camera, these guys, it says, uh, uh, they stood upon their feet, and great fear came upon them all. And they uh, that heard, uh, and they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, "Come up hither." And they ascended up into heaven in a cloud, and their enemies beheld them. And the same hour was there a great earthquake, and a tenth part of the city fell. And in the earthquake were slain of men seven thousand, and the remnant of the, were affrighted and gave glory to the God of heaven. The second woe is past, and behold, the third woe cometh quickly. The great and dreadful day of the Lord has come. And, but Elijah, 
even at the end, a bunch of people heard the voice from heaven, saw them rise from the dead, changed their mind, they gave glory to the God of heaven. It was the last chance. Now comes the fire of heaven down to consume those enemies that didn't repent and to judge them. Like I said, there's a warning all the way through here. We didn't read Revelation chapter 14, but a warning about being saved. For us, salvation is through the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, as the Apostle Paul preached the cross. I should do that so you see it. For them, it's the warning about the kingdom is at hand and to endure through the end, not to take the mark of the beast. But for you and I, it's to believe in the cross work of Christ and through the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ to receive the gift of eternal life. Well, those were the two witnesses. That's the end of Elijah's past ministry, and yet there's a future ministry that, w- that will happen in the tribulation. Thanks for your patience. <laughs> Let's pray. Our God and our Father, we do thank you for the time we spent. I, I pray that everyone here does thoroughly understand the gospel, really has taken to heart the things that are written in your Bible, not only concerning Israel, but concerning the grace that we're, we have the opportunity to be a part of today and has trusted in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ for the payment of sin, realizing that the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, and that Jesus Christ will judge this earth, will bring those that have believed into his kingdom on earth for Israel and the world then, us into the heavens, and, uh, and then set up his kingdom, which ultimately will be heaven and earth. Thank you for the opportunity to teach these things. Thank you for the patience of these saints. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.